Sciences. This is a webinar that's hosted by the National Association of Scholars. Uh, I'm Scott Turner. I'm director of the uh, of the Intrusion of Diversity into the Sciences project uh, there. And among other things, I I, uh, I organize uh, this webinar series. Our <clears throat> our guest tonight is uh, is Professor John Stadden. He's uh, emeritus uh, James B. Duke Professor of uh, Psychology, and among many other titles at Duke University. Um, and he has just published a very provocative book. I don't have a copy of the book itself, but I can hold up the uh, the, the the title page of my uh, Kindle version, my review copy actually, and it's called Science in an Age of Unreason. And uh, very provocative title and the book is filled with even more provocative uh, ideas. So welcome, John. I'm looking forward to the next hour or so. And uh, uh, why don't you tell us uh, about you? Oh, and I should say, by the way, that the book has been published. It's uh, uh, it's available from June. Um, and I'm sure we could say it's available in fine bookstores and uh, internet uh, purveyors everywhere. So uh, again, welcome, John. Um, we're eager to talk about your book. Well, thank you, Scott. Yeah, available in Walmarts everywhere, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I've got, I've got a, an actual copy of the book just to show you if you're interested. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, this is an accumulation of, of uh, thoughts and essays and blogs over several years. And it started out when I noticed some very serious deviations from what I took to be normal science. The book is in five parts. The first part, in some ways, is the artist because it started with an article I wrote in Quillette, which is a well-known blog, I think, uh, about the structure of religion, which is, doesn't seem very scientific, but I was interested in the relationship between religion and secular humanism. I'm personally an agnostic, so I don't think I have a dog in that fight, but the... Uh, the point of that uh, was uh, that secular humanism and indeed any system of life involves beliefs that cannot be proved by science. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. The, uh, the second section is about Darwinism, evolution of Darwinism. And there, uh, I was concerned about two things. One is that a lot of uh, biologists or many biologists seem to think that they can derive their ethical system, their moral system, from evolution, um, some more explicit than others. Um, E.O. Wilson, wonderful guy, I knew him a little bit, went around his ant lab at Harvard years ago. He was a splendid guy, wonderful science writer. He's the uh, uh, originator of the term sociobiology and so on, really a brilliant, brilliant guy. But in some of his books, he seems to ver verge on saying that evolution gives us a value system. Now, more explicit and much less sophisticated is another person I was well acquainted with, B.F. Skinner. B.F. Uh -huh. Skinner, the originator of operant conditioning. I worked in his lab, although not, not according to his rules generally, at Harvard, and he was a, he's a wonderful man. But he explicitly says that uh, the good is what secures the survival of the species. Now, that may or may not be a, 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 a well, it's a terrible idea in this sense, that you can't predict you can't predict what will uh, conduce the survival of the species. And that was one of my points in the first part. So as a section on religion, I think the next section is about the problems of the profession. A lot of people who are not scientists are not aware that science has changed a lot from uh, the, the 19th century when it was pretty much a vocation. A lot of scientists had their, their own money, could support themselves, were not uh, obliged to apply for grants, project grants. So the problem with that, I might say something about that. So I do talk about some of those differences, the changed incentives that come uh, from being someone like Darwin, who could spend, he could afford not, not only monetarily, but professionally to spend 20 years before he published his ideas. I mean, that's absolutely extraordinary. And he's even gotten criticism for that because he was, quote, scooped by Alfred Russell Wallace, by, who sent him an essay in 1858, yeah. 21 years after Darwin had originally laid down his idea. And during that time, of course, Darwin had amassed a huge amount of data to really support it. That's yeah. the right way to do it. That is yeah, the right yeah. way to do it. But there's no way you can do it now when people are evaluated by bureaucrats to have 
and want something that they can count. So they count citations or impact factor or other things, which are completely unrelated or almost completely yes. to the scientific merit of the work. So I have a little bit of a discussion of that. Uh, so I talk about profession and then the fourth section, I have to read my own book here to find out what it's all about, uh, is about social science. Fourth section about social science is a horrible, horrible mess for all sorts of reasons. Um, one is, it's very complicated. I mean, you're studying human beings, not just individual human beings, but human beings in society and groups. It's unimaginably complex, especially as we're one of them. I mean, it's a very, very, very difficult thing. But the result has been that social science of all kinds, from uh, psychology to sociology to economics, has subdivided into hundreds and hundreds of little divisions. And this works given the incentives under which scientists work. You want a, a, a sympathetic crew of critics for your work, right? They're going to yeah. cite you, they're going to publish your papers, they're going to give you grants. So there's been huge incentives to this mad subdivision of social science. And finally, um, the last section is on history of science, which is a fascinating area. There's some great historians of science and some terrible ones. But I noted that in recent years, um, it seems to be dominated by uh, people, mostly ladies, who are wonderful writers. They're great writers, but they don't really understand what they're writing about. They don't understand the science, and I could expand on that a little bit. And there's another example from uh, a, a, an article I wrote, which didn't go into the book. It was published as a separate paper on a lady at Harvard who wrote about behaviorism. Now I know about behaviorism. I grew up with it. Harvard <laughs> in my day was a hot bit of behaviorism. And she, she's totally ignorant of the whole thing, but writes, and she's at Harvard. That makes, makes it rather hard to bear. She's at hard, Harvard there, but she, she said that B.F. Skinner, who worked, of course, with rats and pigeons, his, his thesis, which is the only um, thing she cites, his book, Behavior of Organism, his thesis was on ants. No, it wasn't on ants. <laughs> and one other thing I can't help mentioning, she, she talked about a measurement in a technical experiment she's talking about. And she said something like, um, the value of the stimulus ranged between three volts and four amps. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, oh, no, no. That's what you said. Yeah. Yeah. How big was the house? It was between two feet. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, what, what color is the sky? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a grotesque mistake. So yeah. that's the worst. I mean, it, it's at the low end, there are some wonderful yeah. historians of science like Janet Brown and so on and so on, and some intermediate ones like J.D. Bernal. I could talk. Anyway, I'll stop talking and let, let, you, let you get on with it. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so yeah, I, I, I found it to be actually a fascinating book, uh, uh, full of all kinds of, uh, full of many pithy phrases and, uh, and uh, uh, pointed arguments. Uh, I was especially interested in, in your comments about uh, evolution and evolutionism and Darwinism, because uh, I, that's that's very close to my field. And uh, you know, you're right. The the whole story of Wallace and Darwin is a fascinating one that that, that still, I think, needs to be told in full. Um, but the the one of the uh, phrases that you coined in there um, in the book, which I thought was very telling, was uh, scientific imperialism. And, uh, you know, we, <clears throat> we, we uh, in order to understand scientific imperialism, you'll be able to say more about this, but uh, uh, it's, it, it's all tied in with the distinction between science and scientism, which is the idea that uh, if you're a scientist and very smart, you are entitled to opine on all kinds of things you're not uh, qualified to. Uh, I've seen a number of Nobel Prize winners that uh, fall into that uh, into that uh, uh, trap uh, uh, very um, very easily, too readily, in fact. Uh, uh, but um, you know the, this this whole issue of of science as imperialism, rather than science as something that liberates us from uh, unreason, I, I thought was a very interesting take uh, on, on this. I, I wonder if you could expand a little bit on this idea of scientific imperialism. Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I th think a better phrase for science is, it's, and I think I use this in the book, is that science is a map, not a destination. Yeah. In other words, it, it tells you what the facts are, but it doesn't tell you what to do about them. Unfortunately, that has been totally, totally confused in the modern world. That's 
that's really one of the main uh, impetuses or impetus for the book is because of this confusion. Um, yeah, scientific impetus. I guess my starting point, and I make a big deal of this, is, is, is David Hume, the wonderful Scottish philosopher of the Enlightenment, that he made a huge, he made a, a, an emphatic distinction between facts and values. A fact is a fact. It doesn't tell you what to do and about anything. That comes from your values. And an example, I, 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 there are many examples you can give. One that occurs to me is the COVID crisis, okay? The facts, even early on in the COVID crisis, were that people with comorbidities, older people, were more uh, susceptible, were more at risk for the virus, okay? Now, I think most of us have a value system which says uh, that they should get priority for treatment. They should get priority for treatment. But you could have a completely different value system. If, you, if you're a ruthless evolutionary uh, uh, values person, you say, no, they should be the last. They're the least valuable people to decide. Let them go, right? So the, the fact of that disparity between uh, a risk disparity doesn't tell you actually what to do. But all too often, um, people assume that it does. Another aspect of this is more proximal, is that the scientific establishment is now encouraging people, encouraging scientists to mix value with fact. I mean, if you read Nature, I have a thing coming out on the racialization of nature and so on, Nature magazine, one of the two top science magazines, science is the same. They encourage scientists to speak up on political issues. Well, that's fine. They're citizens like anybody else. They're entitled to speak up. But they're not entitled to waive their science as they're doing so. Their science gives them no special uh, values qualification. Their science may tell them, well, I know the risks are here, X, Y, and Z, and therefore policy X says you should do such and so. But mm -hmm. the science by itself doesn't qualify them as wise men. And I think it's terrible that the journals are, uh, these two top journals are, involving this diversity, DEI, diversity, uh, and in, in, what's it, diversity X, what's it? What's the diversity, second? equity, and inclusion. Equity. We, we, we horrible, have it memorized and burned into horrible, our brains because we, word, we think it about it a lot. Mean, yeah. yeah, equity does not yeah. mean quality of opportunity. It means the opposite. Yeah. That mm -hmm. they're, they're infusing that into the policies of the journal. <laughs> Somebody, I think, from NAS just asked, uh, asked us, do we know about DEI policies mm -hmm. in the US? Mm -hmm. So I Googled, I Googled it. And mm -hmm. the first department that came up that has a requirement that people take these DEI treatments was, wait for it, can you guess the department that came up first? Uh, yours. <laughs> think, of, oh, think of the most unlikely department, cell biology. Cell <laughs> biology. I mean, it beggars yeah. belief, you know, what on earth yeah. has cell biology got to do with DEI? And so, so this really is everywhere. And the yeah. scientific establishment encourages it. I, mean, I have a little section in, in the book about NSF, which yeah. has, got, has devoted literally tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars to increasing the number of women in computer science, increasing the number of women. This, this is the National Science Fund. Well, yeah. my goodness, obviously women have been terribly discriminated against. You've got to do something about it. Well, no, that's not the problem. They just aren't yeah. enough. According to what? According to yeah. some, you know, grotesque set of values. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I'll stop talking and let you get off. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the, this, the, the whole uh, penetration of DEI ideology, or as we like to refer to it uh, as uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, which I think is, uh, gives you a more apt uh, acronym there. You know, we, we, we've been, we've been delving into this quite uh, extensively and, and, uh, you know, even beyond cell biology being an unlikely venue for this, uh, it seems to have gotten into some of the really top 
tier research universities like MIT, oh, yeah. for example, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and uh, the deeper you go, the more shocking it is, and the more uh, unreal this whole thing uh, uh, seems to be, you know, it's, yeah. it's almost like a mind virus that, uh, that, um, that, that is, you know, spreading through uh, the sciences, kind of like, uh, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, famous movie, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you know, it's, it, it's almost this this uh, amazing uh, uh, hysteria, and I was going to bring this up a little bit later in the in in the chat, but let me just bring it up now because uh, uh, it's uh, it's actually relevant to um, to the conversation that we're having. And so let me just share my screen uh, quickly. Um, I hope uh, people can see it here. So. So this is a quotation that's abbreviated a bit from uh, a book that was published in 1994, uh, mm -hmm, yeah. uh, quite a while ago, almost 28 years ago, and, and if I did my math correctly. And, and uh, uh, it's from their book, uh, Paul Gross's and Norman Levitt's book, Higher Superstitions, The Academic Life and Its Quarrels with Science. And it's, uh, as I say here, I think it's prescient and tragic. Uh, uh, what they say here is that, you know, uh, uh, hostility to science is nothing new. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the whole <clears throat> postmodern philosophy that you no know, facts aren't facts, they're feelings or impressions or, or things like this that have equal validity across you know, all kinds of different, uh, different perspectives. But uh, uh, I've highlighted some, uh, in bold, some sentences. And uh, he's saying back then in 19, they're saying back then in 1994 that we probably, we meaning scientists, probably don't need to fear for the safety or intellectual freedom of the sciences on the basis of these bizarre lucubrations, which, uh, which basically is the entire content of, of his book. And he goes on to say that, well, we must hope that the painful bolus of postmodernism will pass, blah, 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 provided that the scientists' resistance to jargonistic snow jobs is as high as it ought to be. And when I first read this, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this, this hope that was expressed so eloquently by them has been utterly dashed, you know, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the safety or intellectual freedom of the sciences is actually under very severe threat. And, uh, and the, the, the people who are threatening it seem to be winning the game. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, you, I just wonder if we could reflect on that for a little bit. You, you hinted at it when you talked about the, the, the changing culture of science, which has, has gone from more of a, a, a profession or a vocation, as you put it, to being career dominated by bureaucrats and, and so forth. And this has been one of the, one of the um, um, unfor <clears throat> unforeseen circumstances or unforeseen uh, uh, changes that's resulted paradoxically from the enormous amount of money that we put into, into scientific research. And of course, uh, you know, we scientists, we take the money, we think it's wonderful, but we don't realize that uh, along with money comes demands and political power. And, uh, and so, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this prediction by, from Paul Gross and Norman Levitt has, has been so tragically uh, undone. And uh, so I wonder, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, you know? yeah, I'd be happy to talk. I mean, I, I noticed all this going on in the early 90s. I edited a Duke uh, mm -hmm. uh, faculty publication called the Faculty Newsletter, and only for a couple of years. And I, I, I made a vain attempt to, to get people to uh, debate, debate stuff. I mean, I read some of the nonsense of uh, Judith Butler and the postmodern people and so on. And uh, I published one or two articles by scientists, very critical of that. And I, of course, invited these folks to respond and they never responded. There was actually one lady who did respond. Um, but in general, there was zero response. There was no interaction and so on. And, but I thought this is so ridiculous. How can it possibly survive? I mean, one of the, uh, I wrote a little article for the uh, academic questions. I don't know quite when it's coming out. 
about the faith of science. And science does have a faith. You've got to believe certain things in order to do science. And one of them is to believe that there is a single truth. There's an answer, one answer, and it's not personal. You know, it's a, John Zeman years ago wrote a book called Public Knowledge. I mean, a scientific conclusion should be demonstrable to and by anyone. Okay. So the idea that there are multiple truths, which is now taken over from parts of the sort of postmodern descendants, is totally inimical to science. I mean, you can't do science. You, not only can you not do science, you're not likely to get a harmonious society either. You, if I have my truth and you have your truth, we'll fight it out. You know, that's the only resolution. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it is, it is a strange thing. And I, I had a revelatory experience a couple of years ago I mean, I've been retired for a long time and I, moved, I I shut my lab because I was sick of the whole grant application process. I was spending too much time writing grants, not enough time doing science. And that has not improved, I'm sure, since then. And we might talk a little bit about that. So I've kind of lost contact with the department. There's been a turnover of faculty. The, the kind of people who do sort of biological stuff that I did has dwindled to just a, a, one or two or three people. A whole lot of new people and so on. So I, I, I was not familiar with the general tone of the department. And then in 2020, I say I shouldn't bore you with this, but I haven't told you about this. No, that's so. fine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've told other people. So in 2020, there was a call from the chair of our department. I can't call him a chairman anymore. He's a chair, inviting all of us to sign a petition. This, of course, in the wake of the George Floyd business, yeah. to sign a petition called "Shut Down STEM." Right. A, de a department-wide call to sign this thing called shutdown state. I thought, what the heck is this? What, what, mm. what's, what's George Floyd got to do with us? The statistics are uncertain. Is there really a, a race problem with black people and so on and so on? But what's it got to do with the department as a whole? If you, as an individual citizen, want to go off and sign something, fine. But why should the department call on everybody to do this? So I, I sent a response to this a broadcast email saying something like, well, if there was a dissent column, I would be inclined to sign it. That was my response. And I gave a link to a, a, another Quillette piece I'd written on systemic racism, which also struck me as a very questionable notion. I mean, if you've got a, a scientific concept, you've got to be able to measure it or have some idea how, how it should be measured. And I couldn't see any such thing in systemic racism. It seemed to be an excuse for uh, rejecting alternative explanations that had to do with individual differences and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was that was that. Well, it was a, there was a riot. The first thing that happened was I got a handful of responses from people who agreed with me. All of them wishing to remain uh, anonymous. <laughs> And one guy even wanted me to use a non-Duke email, such was the degree of his paranoia about this. Or maybe it wasn't paranoia. Maybe he's quite right to feel like mm. that. But anyway, I was, I was absolutely uh, uh, gobsmacked, as the Brits say. I mean, I had no, what's going on here? Why, why would people uh, see an unfortunate uh, killing in, uh, in, in Minneapolis as having anything whatever to do with them? I mean, why mm. was this such a big... And I still don't really understand, but somehow... To everybody there, it was a huge, big deal. And it is, as you say, it's like it's some virus. Uh, maybe you've got a clever lab in China and it produces these things. But I mean, <laughs> an extremely ingenious virus has taken over otherwise sensible people and converted them to this kind of racial, gender, uh, equality, equity paranoia. I really, really don't know. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure that answers all of your question, but I can resume if you have something else you'd like to say. Well, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 I, I also have been reaching out to scientists, you know, as part of my, my, my position here. And, uh, you know, my experience has been the same as yours. You know, there are a lot of people, colleagues who are very, very alarmed at what's going on and see it correctly as the kind of death of science. And, uh, and, and, and they're just not willing often 
for good rational reasons, not willing to stick their heads above the parapet. And, 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 you know, what it boils down to, and this is just my take on it, you know, they're, they're, you know, with money comes power and with money comes demands from the people who are providing the money uh, uh, for accountability, you know, to ensure that the money is spent properly. And, and, and that's changed, seems to have changed dramatically in the past, in the past uh, couple of decades, you know, I, you know, uh, when I was, uh, starting out in my academic position, you know, it was the administrators and faculty were like the dogs and cats, you know, they, 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 they sort of uh, were natural enemies. And, and I saw over, over the years, this, 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 this gradual and very slow change, you know, it, 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 it started off as, uh, well, let's govern together, you know, never mind that the interests of faculty and the interests of administrators are, are often so not diametrically not opposed that, that you know, governing, yeah, yeah, governing together is, is not really, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a very effective way uh, towards that. But the difference between so the scientists and the faculty and the administrations were the administrations really have all the political power in this game and and uh, you know they 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 didn't dare um, try to impose it all at once but you know gradually it's like the frog uh, being boiled in the gradually uh, uh, warming up pot of water you know you know be, before you know it you know you look around and you've suddenly lost your your academy and 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 in the meantime you know you've had a you know th there's a demographics in fact uh, in the meantime, you've had a number of of, uh, of younger faculty coming up who who have worked their way into this ideology, and rewards follow to them fall to them from uh, from doing what the administrators want them to do. And so, and so, I think that's part of the reason right now. You've had this demographic change. We as scientists haven't really been aware of it or attentive to it, and now we look around us, and and uh, you know, people who who still hue to this old idea of, uh, of, of science as a form of dispassionate reason, trying to get nature to, to give us the answers unfiltered by uh, people's um, particular personal uh, dispositions or, or views on the world. Uh, uh, you know, we've just been, you know, being driven extinct in this by this 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 uh, this new environment that we're working in and uh, you know you mentioned that uh, scientists aren't evaluated anymore by the intellectual discoveries discoveries they make they're evaluated by you know not only these bogus quantitative measures of scientific productivity whatever that is but also by whether people actually hew to the narrative that uh, that that is being brought into the uh, into into the sciences, and uh, I just read a very interesting uh, article about Rosalind Franklin. Uh, Nicholas Wade actually published an, an article about you know was Rosalind Franklin actually cheated out of her Nobel Prize, and uh, it turns out she wasn't. You know, but uh, but that narrative is very very strong. This narrative of uh, victimhood, and and uh, you know we uh, reward people who hew to that narrative, and and like I say, the world has changed around. Uh, uh, old characters like you and me, and uh, and now it's a, an entirely different uh, different culture. And and uh, uh, you know you wonder can science actually survive in in yeah. this? And and uh, you know your book uh, ended on a very hopeful note. You know I must say uh, uh, that yes, if we just hew to these ideals, you know it'll all be all right. But what worries me, of course, is that there aren't enough people left who will hew to those ideas. And and you know how do we work our way back to what what science should be should be I, I guess, yeah no yeah. You're, you're right i mean it's sad that to, to read if you read dissenting articles nine times out of ten they're by emeritus faculty now it's not because they're old it's because they're unconstrained i mean you're safe you yeah, can yeah. write you know they're relatively mm -hmm. safe we can write what we want i think part the another way to another thing to say about science it is it's it's misconceived. Now the, the misconception was natural. Uh, post in the early post-war period, uh, people had idealized images of scientists. The, the biographies you could read were uh, all, of, all of one kind. But as as science became uh, a, a source 
not just of knowledge, but for ma- of money for the universities, uh, it changed. And the, the way the funding was delivered was a huge mistake. I remember early in the, early in the day when NIH, National Institutes of Health, was funding people, it had, I think, what they were called K awards. And these were amazingly lifetime awards for individuals. Now that in a way is the right way to fund science because you cannot predict what's gonna happen. It's completely wrong to fund basic science via project awards. You don't know what's gonna happen. A project award is perfectly fine for engineering or applied science. The goal is known. Uh, Approximations to it can be evaluated and so on. But in basic science, you're just trying to figure out something. And a lot of stuff you, you do will turn out to be a silly error and so on and so on. But that's it. the trial and error is what it's all about. It's, it's inseparable from, from, from the game. So the, the, there were these K awards. But lo and behold, some of the people who got K awards didn't find anything or they goofed or they you know went on holidays or who knows what. <laughs> Bureaucrats don't like that, right? That, you know, they want a number. They want to be able to label people and so on and so on. So gradually the K awards were reduced from... A lifetime to five years, one year renewable. Indeed, I got one of those. God bless. Was, well, uh, congratulations. I, yeah. I was incredibly grateful for that. It made a huge difference in my, my, my freedom to do research. But still, I had to get money for the, for, for the research. So for, for yeah. the, whole, the whole story. Um, but now I, I think they've abolished them. They don't have them at all. It's all these silly project grants. So there are two problems. With them. First of all, they're project grants. Three, actually. First of all, they're project grants. It, uh, Mostly it's science fiction. I felt you had to present experiments you were going to do. And either you'd done them, which was good because you could get, meet all the possible objections, or you were never going to do them because something else came up that looked better. So it was absolute, absolute uh, BS kind of, kind of format for these, for these grants. Um, another thing, the other thing that's wrong about this whole thing is it's what economists call a monopsony. That is, any, any individual scientist really only has one source for his money. I mean, there are few, few things like the yeah. Foundation and so on, God bless them, which add a little di- a real diversity to the thing. But basically, you have to apply to NSF or NIH, and you're, there's one committee that your work's going to go to. That's a terrible, terrible idea, because uh, even the most conscientious committee and all the committees I have been on are fine. They were very conscientious. But yeah. all it took was a slight hesitancy on one of the two or three experts in your area and your project was doomed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a terrible problem. And the other problem, of course, they're only three or four years. And as Darwin shows, if you're going to find something important, it takes a lot longer than three or four years. And the result has been the evolution of something which even in my day was known as the LPU. You, you used to that, you know that? Least, least publishable unit, yes. Least publishable <laughs> unit, that's it. Yeah. And uh, I'm proud to say I didn't do that. I went back the other day and looked at one of my earlier papers, which is called a Choice, Timing and Choice, a Preliminary Analysis. And it's a massive paper. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was a preliminary analysis. I mean, I, I, I didn't know the whole story. I still don't know the whole story. Yeah, but I don't yeah. think anybody would do that now. I don't think anybody yeah. would. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a terrible business. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the NSF, which is the, uh, which is the funding agency I have the most experience with, uh, you know, they, they, I think they, they, they realize some of the pathologies that come from the funding structure that you're, that you're talking about, and you know, among these are, are you know, um, building up trivial science, uh, uh, you know, crowd following and conformity and emphasis on productivity, productivity, and it's, In it's, paper, yeah. it's. Well, well, papers. I mean, it's it's got to the point where you know you 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 almost don't need humans writing the papers anymore. You know, you 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 have uh, you have uh, uh, smart systems that can take a set of data and actually write the paper, and then you know you put it into someplace else, and you have a machine that actually evaluates it. And and uh, you know, no humans need to be you know in it at all. And and this is one of the pathologies that 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 comes from this. And I. And I think there are conscientious people in the sciences. I know some of them who who are aware of this problem, but they cannot seem to nudge the NSF 
as a body away just from that. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, you know, how do you do that? And, and, you know, for, for academics like ourselves, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of government coming in and, and, and saying that, well, no, this is a mistake. We need to change the way that we, that we fund science because we're, 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 we're getting a lot of bogus science for all the money that we're spending on it. You know, that's not something that I think any self-respecting uh, intellectual would want, but, you know, where are we now? I, I mean, we, we've, the NSF is a completely politicized operation. It funds an enormous amount of politic, uh, science for political reasons rather than for intellectual reasons. And, you know, we both know that there are islands in the ac academy left where people still have the right uh, attitude towards science, but they're becoming ever rarer. So, so you know, what are your thoughts on, on, on how we break away from this, from yeah. this uh, rut that we seem to have worked ourselves into? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are th there are serious serious problems. I have a, a good friend in the physics department. He was the chair of the physics department for a while. Very bright guy, and I can remember talking to him about a colleague. A colleague, you probably he's deceased now, but he, he was in the biology one. Very yeah. wonderful guy. And I said, well, it's, isn't it wonderful that he can do his research without applying for grants? It was very inexpensive, and he did good research. And you know, isn't that great? And my ex-chair uh, colleague said, no, that's terrible. He should be getting money for the university. I I know. Said, oh, my God, <laughs> that's unbelievable. I mean, well, I'll tell you one thing that should happen is that there should be no overhead in the grants. I mean, they should remove any incentive for universities to urge people to go out and get research funding. That's yeah, I, sure. I've, argued, I've argued that for years myself. Yeah, I'm I mean, glad to hear been, someone else thinks that. Yeah, I mean, it's an evil practice. It has terrible side effects and so on. And the universities have a, a, bureaucracy, a bureaucracy which specializes in just if I hire and hire overheads and so on. So that's, that's one thing. Which we the other thing is much more, well, the other things are more difficult. One other is to diversify the sources of funding. Yeah. They're not, uh, uh, I mean, when I started out, I could apply to NSF and to uh, NIH, NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health. But the people at NSF got pressure from the behavioral ecologists who said, you can't give money to psychologists, they can get money from NIH. So yeah. more or less autonomously, independently, the, yeah. uh, the, the, the committee that I used to uh, be re reviewed by said, no, no, we're not going to uh, support these lab studies anymore. We're going to support these poor old behavioral ecologists who indeed were in, in, uh -huh. in, in difficulty, no question that they were. But it was a, yeah, that reduced the diversity by a factor of, factor of two. Um, the, so that's diversity of funding is, would be a great thing. But how do you do it? How do you do it? I, I don't know. And the third thing, of course, is to support people. Well, there's that fourth thing as well. The third thing is to support people, not projects. In basic, yeah. not in engineering. But yeah, yeah. Support people. But that looks too elite to, to, to the community these days. My goodness, you, you're going to support this yeah. guy for life. What's he ever done? You know, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Not, not so much what she's ever done, but what's he ever done, right? So it's it's a problem. That would be, that would be a problem. Yeah. Another yeah. related problem... Uh, which I mentioned briefly in the book, how many scientists should you have? How many yes. scientists? <laughs> I mean, not all problems are soluble, you know, but if you've got a bunch of people whose uh, livelihood depends on appearing to solve problems, then they will appear to solve problems. I mean, there's no question about it. My guess is, particularly in social science, there's just way too many scientists, way too many scientists. Um, I... So I would say take away a lot of money, but and that's not going to be popular. <laughs> well, where yeah. will it go anyway? Will it go somewhere? With... And you know, grant, grant, grant getting has so many bad aspects. So my first grant I got when I was uh, at the University of Toronto it was an American grant. God bless America. I got it for a ten double space pages uh, application. Right? It was a huge bonus. Wow, he's got a grant. Yeah. Isn't it great? Right? It was what, what the psychologists call a positive. Uh, reinforcement yeah. schedule, positive reinforcement schedule. Yeah. But yeah. by the time I retired, it was not having a grant that was a punishment. <laughs> it was. Yeah, yeah. 
called a shock avoidance schedule. I mean, it's a completely different kind of... Uh, so the yeah. whole thing has flipped over and so on. Yeah, yeah. I think so. we should be looking at the number of scientists, the kind of science they do and so on. But who's going to look at it? Who is objective? Who, who will be a fair judge of these kinds of things? So, yeah, yeah. So start discussing it, I'd say. Let's just start talking about it and see yeah. if somebody comes up with a better, better system they have than what we have now. Yeah. There are uh, programs out there uh, like the Human Frontier Science Program. I don't know if you know them. I, mm -hmm. I was a, I was a PI for them for a few years, and and you know they 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 have this idea, this ethic of of okay, well here's the money, um, you know you decide what to do with it, you know, and and they have a very interesting funding structure, and, and they were especially t um, uh, trying to support younger scientists who, you know, let's face it, you know, the, the younger ones are where the energy and the creativity are, and they're the ones that we should be supporting. And uh, it's, it's, I don't want to give the idea that that was a failure, but one of the things that came out of their evaluation of their self-evaluation of their program is that the younger scientists often felt um, uh, undervalued because they weren't you know, taking this high risk approach to science, you know, exploring really, really uh, um, uh, out on the frontier questions, wasn't producing papers and at enough of a pace. There was a perception among older colleagues that they were kind of being self-indulgent, uh, you know, and pursuing this uh, kind of ego-driven science. And, and, and you know, it, I don't want to sound uh, sound very pessimistic, but I think we've worked ourselves actually into a very, very serious uh, okay, serious yeah. problem for science. Um, uh, I see that, that there's some questions coming in um, uh, for uh, for the for the viewers. Uh, please direct your questions to the Q and A button on the bottom. Uh, but let's uh, let's go see what the what the what what the viewers are, are saying. Uh, you should be able to see them also, yeah, John. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so uh, uh, let's take the uh, earliest one first, to be fair. Okay. So why not have a serious civil debate about unfettered versus correct science type of interaction? Again, in a civil minor is educational, whereas talking back and forth where the speakers each hold the same premises. So, so, um, so what about that? Um, yeah, I'd like to hear more from the questioner, Alexandra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, what he's or, or yeah. She, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, is, uh, yeah. And one thing I will say: one of the huge obstacles to debate is this uh, hypersensitivity that pe people uh, are now expected to show. Right. Mm. So you can, can tell somebody, and it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, I have a colleague at, at Duke. I had lunch with him the other day, and we were talking about. Um, some of these problems and the racial issues and uh, discrimination all that, in in a, in a cafe, and he lowered his voice. I said, I said, you lower. Why are you lowering your voice? Right. I, I mean, he's, I mean, he's totally conditioned. So if you say something, yeah. like, well, you know, uh, a lot of people have shown the blacks to the lower average IQ than the whites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Average self-identified group. It's not saying whether it's racial or not, or genetic or not. People will draw back, you know, they'll draw back. Mm. And that's a huge, a huge block to any real scientific discussion. I mean, there's this yeah. wonderful quote from Darwin that uh, a scientist should have no wishes, uh, no passions, or no no, or no wishes, no desires, a veritable heart of stone, I think he says. Yeah, you, yeah. You've, you've mm -hmm. got to be able to shut off the emotional bit and just look at the, the, the facts, the data. Are they true? Yeah. Are they not? What do they mean? You know, and so on and so on. Yeah. And yeah. people are really, really, really. Uh, I have relatives, uh, <laughs> young relatives, who, who, uh, when I seem to question the notion of systemic racism, get quite emotional. You know, mm. and it's that, all they've heard. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I yeah. mean, this it, it all started with this business of um, microaggressions. I mean, yeah. I made fun of it a few times. I mean, <laughs> you hear some a sensitive fellow hears somebody else. Who, Ask, asking his friend where are you from and gets tr triggered by this you know it's terrible <laughs> asking where they're from but mm. a totally reasonable question <laughs> anyway it's nothing to do with you anyway and so so uh, i think we need to punish that kind of reaction honestly i yeah. mean such yeah. a potent reaction and yeah. it's so inimical to any kind of objective 
calm discussion. So, true. yeah, I think the question is absolutely right. You know, we need to have yeah. discussions, but in order to do that, we, we need to have a few ground rules. And the ground rules are we just look at the facts, guys. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, we used to have them. Yeah, yeah, we used to have those rules. And uh, even if they weren't fact based, you know, we could at least conduct our discussions in a civil manner. And I, I don't want to speak for Patrick Shea, who's the originator of that comment, but I, 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 I think where he's going with unfettered science versus correct science was the distinction that you're drawing here. You know, you know, unfettered science should be free to explore any question, uh, uh, even if it does, uh, you know, rub some people the wrong way. And you know, we've We've certainly seen examples of that in evolutionary biology, for example, oh, you know, absolutely. And uh, as opposed to, you know, I, he only said correct, but I think he might have meant uh, politically correct. But we have yeah. really lost that ability to carry on civil discussions. You know, I I, I remember when I was a graduate student, we used, you, we used to love to argue and uh now it's not so much fun anymore. So I got, yeah, I got to mention one thing, and that is the, the yeah. relationship of diversity to all of this. You know? Yeah, uh -huh. diversity is great. So I, I had fun a few years ago with uh, um, an editorial meeting, at the Atlantic mag magazine, which used to be a good magazine. Now it's sporadically good, mm -hmm. but this is a fascinating discussion between the editor, uh, called Goldberg, I forget, and the famous Tanahazi Coates, the black writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of discussion about how, how great diversity was, and, and they quoted everybody. And um, it used to be all men, it used to be all white men. Now there are a lot of women and so forth. And one of the young women, <laughs> at some point, says, "Well, yeah, the guy tells me that it used to be a lot freer discussion. Discussion with just guys." <laughs> okay, yeah. Because, yeah. You, know, you can read any 19th century novel, and there's certain things you can't say in front of a lady, right? So, yeah, so yeah. I think yeah, a certain uniformity yeah. of the group is necessary to get, get a really free, free discussion. I mean, yes. the whole multicultural idea is BS, actually. I mean, if, yeah. if you think you, I, I read a little paper about this academic so question. If you mix the people with different beliefs, you may mm -hmm. get. A, a wider discussion, or you may not, depending on who's offended by what. I mean, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've I've been uh, I've been uh, filling in for Patrick Shea, but uh, uh, Patrick actually has his hand up in the uh, in, oh, in the hi, chat, Patrick. and and uh, we could hear directly from him. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate the dialogue. Uh, my tutor in Oxford, Jeffrey Harrison, was a geneticist and a physical anthropologist. It was one of the first to attack uh, in the 60s, the genetic-based racist theory. Uh, I've continued that tradition in attacking the bell curve and other things. Mm -hmm. But the premise of a debate allows the audience to be educated, whereas if the same uh, epistemology is coming from a single speaker, they're not as able, in my judgment, to be educated with the Latin term educera, meaning to lead oneself. And I, I just think that we need to have forums where civility and rationality are the premise. Thank you. Uh, so I would just ask Patrick, you, you know, um, do you think we've lost that? <laughs> I've been <laughs> at Stanford University and the University of Utah, and um, I was warned at Stanford that I had to use correct terms. Uh, now, the way I teach uh, is very interactive and is rather free discussion. Um, but um, I, I think part of the way, if you will, I got away with it was I was always open to responses and suggestions that, you know, a more rational way of discussing it was better than an ideologically based way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least one hopes we can come together on rationality. You know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that anymore, uh, Patrick. But uh, you know, it's a. Uh, um, I think this is is uh, strikes to the heart of of John's book. You know, are we living in an age of reason or an age of unreason now? And uh, I think uh, when you start getting into the emotional uh, issues and people getting triggered, I think we're very deep into the into the unreason realm. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, I must say, I'm very disturbed by reading books by famous people that, if you look into them, are absolute nonsense. I mean, <laughs> I mean, this this chap Kendi, for example, is apparently a very successful guy, but his whole book is premised on the assumption that individual differences are irrelevant. I mean, his whole book is premised on that. And that's nonsense. That's why why do people buy it? I, I I don't I just don't get it. I suppose because the emotion overrides the reason part or something. I don't know. And it's got nothing to do with genetic differences or just individual differences, whatever the cause. Yeah. Makes yeah. a difference yeah. to how well you do in life and so on and so on. Yeah. Why is it so hard to, for people to accept this? I I I, I, I confess I am at a loss. Anyway, you go go on with the, we, we have some more questions. I yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just working uh, our way down here. Uh, so Vega G has a couple of uh, comments uh, uh, here. And uh, um, uh, Vega, I don't know if you're a man or a woman, reason, but I have yes, a reaction yes. to Vega G. If you're interested. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, I mentioned briefly in my book, the objections to doing archaeological inquiry, because indigenous people have beliefs, you know, about the gods of their ancestors or whatever. They have a bunch of beliefs. And what I, I found interesting is that the enlightenment belief in the value of truth gave way before these indigenous beliefs. Yeah. yeah. And to me, what that shows is, yeah, you want to be, you want to be um, uh, considerate of people and so on, obviously. But you have to believe in your own scientific worldview or all is lost but the scientific worldview in, in these cases you know, there's some on the west coast uh, this person might remember some of the details um in this case the, the scientific belief in, in seeking the truth gave way before the the values of indigenous people non-scientific values of indigenous people and and we have now where was I? I can't remember. I was reading just within the last day or two. I was reading something about how, how the scientists have to take account of indigenous knowledge. Well, well, fine. They can test the indigenous knowledge. <laughs> if they accept it, they're giving up science. You know, they just accept yeah. it on the word of somebody else. They're giving up science. Anyway, that's what yeah. I have to say about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there is a um, the whole indigenous science thing. You know, it it, it can be. It can be fairly benign, you know. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I, I've worked in a foreign country for most of my research career, and of course, you know, there's certain levels of etiquette and uh, that you follow. But also, it just makes sense to talk to the local scientists or even non-scientists to glean their, glean their knowledge. Uh, but, but then you have some kind of odd things. I was reading something the other day about, uh, about incorporating uh, Maori knowledge of, of, uh, yeah, of, of, of. of the oceans into and and any flowing stream into understanding how turbulence works you know and and uh, you know I, i'm not, not, not you know the, the navier stokes equations are pretty obscure but i think that the, go predict something we'll test it yeah right? i know i know right yeah yeah so uh you know but um on the other hand you know it it does happen where 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 scientists can can uh, uh, impose um, an ideology on on indigenous people. You know, I, I'm I'm here in Namibia, and uh, of course the sand bushmen are a big uh, are a big part of the uh, well, not a big part of the population, but an important part of the population. Okay, yeah. And and I've been reading some books by Robert Gordon, who's a Namibian. He's now an anthropologist at the University of Vermont. Uh, uh, but you know he he makes the point that that, that anthropological science actually, uh, especially in the immediate post-war years, uh, uh, played a significant role in shaping public perceptions of of of, of Bushmen and and among other things it kind of took away uh, Bushmen you know those people's own intrinsic uh, awareness of themselves so so it does work both ways you know you know science can also uh, also uh, exert some kind of not so positive uh, yeah, uh, influences I mean, on anthropology yeah. well I I mean obviously if you're a believer in indigenous values and things uh, if you have it indigenous beliefs and some scientist comes along and shows you that they yeah. have no basis in fact yeah. that 
unfortunate, but I don't think you can blame science for that. I don't think you can blame science for that because there are always beliefs beyond science. In my yeah. first part of the book, I talk about these three aspects to science, the spiritual, the historical, and, and mm. the moral. And you can retain your moral beliefs without needing to believe in the myths yeah. that previously sustained them. Let me put it that yeah. way. I believe I, I believe homosexuality is bad because Allah said so. Right. Well, you can give up Allah and still re re retain your bias. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I see the problem, but it, it really is a terrible problem, actually. Because yeah. An honest yeah. scientific account will undermine a lot of traditional, the historical ones, the ones that refer to the real world. It can yeah. undermine those. But it seems to me that's inevitable. I don't know you either to believe in truth or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's the that's the rub of it, nub of it, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin, Martin Hackworth has an interesting and kind of poignant comment uh, about physics uh, being no longer immune to ways of knowing in quotes uh, and other postmodern uh, ideas. Um, uh, and and uh, he finally um, got tired of fighting it and apparently decided retirement was a better alternative. Uh, by the way, it's an opinion that I share with, with Martin, you know, I'm, I'm having the time of my life being retired here. And, uh, uh, but you know, what, what, what is it about, uh, uh, that, that, that we would s suppose that physics would be immune to ways of knowing, you know, and, and I, I just asked that question because, uh, someone made a comment to me the other day that, that, you know, physics itself makes, makes an assumption of, of, uh, of, of, of how the world is now it's experimentally tested of course but it's a uh, but you know there, there's there's still this idea that's that maybe comes from enlightenment philosophy or 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 whatever that's physics itself is not entirely objective uh, um do you have any thoughts on that or any yeah well I, I wrote this little article which i think is coming out yeah. in the question on the faith uh -huh. of science and in yeah. order to uh -huh. do science you have to believe things that cannot be proved. David Hume yeah. said it, right? Yeah. Your law today may be dis may change tomorrow, right? There's that mm -hmm. question about it. Uh, so, so, so science does have a faith. It's not a faith about particular facts. It's just a faith in the stability and order of the universe. Mm -hmm. And not all cultures are comfortable with that. Uh, I read at least one source which says that Islam was very unsympathetic to that because Allah could pop in at any time and change the laws of nature. Why not? Mm. Uh, if that's true, there's no point trying to find what they are, right? So there mm. is a faith behind science. There's no question about it. And uh, if you don't adhere to that, um, then uh, you can undermine science. Yeah, you can yeah. undermine science. Yeah. Not by yeah. pointing to particular facts, but by saying you're deluded, I have a higher truth or something like that. So people have to decide as yeah. a member of the post enlightenment and so on, do yeah. you buy into that faith or not? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, there's a lot of, um, I think, uh, uh, not very informed arguments being made about what science is you know for example you know a lot of people conflate science with the experimental method whereas in fact science is actually a much broader broader endeavor than, than that and the definition i come down to is you know it's a way of querying nature about its own right. nature so to speak and and uh, you know the, the 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 goal is to try to remove filters that that might uh, give us the wrong answer and uh, niels bohr had a very interesting um, way of putting that, he, he, you know, he, he said that the, 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 that the purpose of science is to gradually strip away all prejudices. And I thought that was a very, uh, very, uh, oh, very, very good way of, point, yeah. of, 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 yeah. of pointing to it. Yeah. But it can't okay. strip away prejudices that are based on faith because it, it can't test them. I mean, suppose, suppose your prejudice is against transgender people or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Science can say, well, a trans woman is really a man, you know, or whatever, uh, but, but it can't go beyond that. It can't strip yeah. away 
Mm. I, I'm not sure about that. My scientific idol, I have to give him a plug, is Richard Feynman. I think he's a one. Yes, okay, uh, yes. Purely <laughs> uh, uh, a joking, Mr. Feynman. I used to give copies of the book to my graduate students at one point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good it. for you <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 you know and i i wonder if we have those people like Feynman anymore you know, so, I know. I know. yeah yeah so um so just going back to the comments here um there's some uh vega g has asked for uh, us to uh, our thoughts on the race issue as for the race issue i suppose many people do suspect that there are differences in iqs cultures etc but they believe the differences are a result of slavery, Jim Crow, and their legacy effects. And uh, and you address this uh, uh, quite directly in your book. You, you, I think you call them endogenous versus exogenous uh, yeah, influences yeah. On, on on behavior. So so you know perhaps uh, you know this is a, yeah, this is a question I, I, you'll have some thoughts on. Yeah, I'll be happy to sound off a little bit on that. Mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. the data are the data are that uh, the average IQ of self-identified American blacks is lower than the IQ, average IQ of self-identified whites and Asians. Okay, what's the reason for it? I mean, in a way, the reason almost doesn't matter. These differences exist and they will, will have effects and that's, that's what the politicians have to deal with. All right, but the question that gets people all hot is what's the reason for this? Is it genetic, whatever? Well, it's interesting that the um, uh, some of the critics of uh, people like uh, Charles Murray and Bell Curve and so on, when uh, people point out that um, Nigerian immigrants, Nigerian immigrants, uh, actually do very well in society, they have I think, slightly higher than average income, uh, their IQ is not lower, and so on and so on. I don't know all the details, but that, that, that's the, the factoid we're talking about. They say, well, of course they're smart. They, only the smart ones got here. Only the smart ones got here. <laughs> yeah. It was exactly the same argument can be made about slaves. Only the dumb ones became slaves. They did yeah. in the state mm -hmm. of slavers. So yeah, it may be a selection. Mm -hmm. the, the answer may be selection. God knows how you test it. Yeah. Certainly a plausible hypothesis. The, the, the African Americans who are here, who, who were descendants of slaves, are at a genetic disadvantage compared to the Africans who got here by immigration. Yeah. One yeah. was selected for abilities and, and conformity with the Western culture and so on, and the others were not. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's my, my yeah, yeah. Point. And you, you also touched upon this in 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 your book, which is, uh, you know, when you look at uh, at uh, a lot of the woke ideology and Ibram X Kendi, Kendi and the whole idea that you have to bring in black people or women because by virtue of them being black or women or some other minority, yeah, exactly. they can bring a different perspective to this, as if they're hardwired into into thinking about the world differently. Which of course is exactly the argument that some of the you know the 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 the, the race-based uh, uh race mongering uh, uh, uh arguments on the other side do you know and yeah. and i wonder if well you know both those you know both both uh, charles murray for example and ibram x kindy are they they I think they fall into the same trap in a different way, which is that they, 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 they verge very closely toward genetic determinism, and 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 part of that comes from our conception of the gene, which has come, you know, been handed down, and that's a whole other, other topic. But uh, you know, I, I think the way to attack that problem is to really rethink uh, our notions of heredity and we're discovering now that it's actually much more broad and much more fluid than, than, yeah, yeah. than we think and and uh, you know and there and there's different kinds of hereditary memory which can include culture of, of yeah, families and, 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 and so forth you know but but we're not going to get there if we can't have honest discussions uh, uh, like this uh, you know like like you know what do these differences of average IQ uh, mean you know because yeah. Uh, one 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 thing we do know about them uh, from reading, you know, Charles Murray's and Hernstein's the bell curve is that this is one of the most rigorously tested and and validated concepts in the social sciences. You know, it, it's not just, oh, you've given us the wrong test, you know, or that's biased in this way. You know, there, what impressed me about uh, uh, Hernstein's and, and Murray's book was was how extensively and critically this idea was tested. And it's, it's it stood up every test 
that stood up against every test that, that, yeah, that, that that's been, that been thrown at it. Yeah, and and so you know, uh, there's an issue we have to deal with. It's a civic issue. It's a biological issue. But somehow we have to have honest conversations about let me, it. And, let me and add one thing. Have. People, uh, uh, the heritability statistic is just a statistic. It doesn't say anything about yeah. genes. It's exactly. Just how similar are the children to the parents, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And it doesn't necessarily say anything about the malleability of the trait. And the example I give uh -huh. is language. Language is just hundred percent heritable. The kids uh -huh. almost invariably learn the language of their parents, but if they're uh -huh. adopted, they learn, they learn a completely different language. So you uh -huh. can't use that statistic as a proxy for. Uh, changeability or educability or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Weiss is, is making some interesting comments here. Uh, she's apparently an anthropologist, I think. Again, I don't want to speak for her, but uh, but you know, she's she's uh, uh, talking about how difficult it is. What we we're just talking about, how difficult it is to have honest conversations when you have one side that's perpetually offended, like in sex differences. And then she goes on to say that uh, uh, many archaeologists were assisted by native peoples in excavations prior to postmodernism. You know, and that you know a very cooperative and and uh, constructive constructive relationship. And and somehow that uh, seems to have you know eroded and uh, and why you know why have we lost that actually really yeah i don't relationship? know i mean you probably know better than i do so working in a third world country but i as i told you earlier i worked with um when i was a 20 year old i worked at a world health organization um, health and nutrition scheme and my co-workers were all african and yeah of course they d delighted to help and so on and so on yeah so I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously, a good uh, anthropologist will pay very serious atten attention to the beliefs uh, and understanding of the pe peoples with whom he works. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 is is Elizabeth saying that uh, anthropologists are now distrusted by indigenous people and they have a hard time collaborating? Is that is that the the, the point? I, I I don't know. Well, again, I, I I don't want to speak for her, but that's the uh, that's the impression that I'm getting from this comment. You know, it was yeah. a it was a uh, it was a nostalgia for a past age oh, where yeah. native peoples and uh, archaeologists and anthropologists could work together constructively. You know, yeah, and, you would uh, think the native peoples would be as curious about their ancestry yeah. as anybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe Elizabeth can can uh, exactly. chime in and cl clarify that. Uh, um, uh, Paul Cohen is asking about climate change science in quotes, and uh, uh, this I think uh, comes into um, your argument about uh, sort of mass hysterias uh, permeating science and 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 uh, you know, beliefs and feelings and panic actually yeah. driving the scientific debate, which is hardly scientific anymore in in, in my opinion you know you uh so um any thoughts well, on that yeah um there are two chapters in the book on climate change I yeah mm -hmm. mentioned that yeah um i'm not an expert but i have a good friend who's a physicist engineer got me interested in it and we mm. went and looked at the public publicly available data and came to very different conclusions i must say from what we're told yeah. now um yeah. two i can say two general things about it one is that the hysteria about extreme climate and so on seems to be almost totally unjustified. If you look at the historical record, severe storms, uh, heat waves, all of this kind of stuff, and that's all available on the internet. Well, yeah. the present is no, not greatly different from the past. Even the uh, temperature record is not seriously different from the past. There have been extremes as high or more uh, than what we're currently experiencing within the last few thousand years. Um, the, the, some other interesting things about this. But the, the two ways to uh, measure climate change or estimate climate change, one are these uh, what's called GCM models, general circulation models, which attempt to model the whole Earth, okay? By dividing it into cubes, you know, and different, right. mm -hmm. and, so and, so. and this is impossibly ambitious. Um, for one thing, we don't have the starting. We don't have the any model has to have initial conditions for which you need to know what's the temperature, humidity, wind velocity, and so on. Every place on the planet, 
sorry, we don't have that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a problem with that. The second thing is you want to be able to predict what's already happened. Well, they made a little bit of progress in that. But as the uh, investment advisor, your investment advisor will repeatedly tell you the past performance is no, no proof of, of future results, right? So you may be able to predict the past, but you won't. Anyway, these models are not good. The, yeah. A chap called Coonan has written an excellent book about it where he points yes. out they're mm -hmm. diverging more now than they used to and so on and so on. So what's the other way to look at it? The other way is to look at correlations. Correlation is not causation. We all know that and we all forget it. But you can look at the correlation between things like carbon dioxide concentration and um, temperature. I was talking to my colleague just this morning and saying, well, has somebody done a cross-correlation, temperature up and down, uh, uh, CO2 up and down, a lag cross correlation, just see, see whether mm -hmm. the uh, CO2 precedes the temperature increase or follows it. What he said, he thought there had been the data like that, I'm yet to see a complete correlation. But what we have shows that mostly the CO2 rise follows the temperature rise. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how creative you want to be, but I don't think anybody's asserting that the cause follows its effect. So the argument that, that CO2 is the major cause of temperature rise, I think, is rather is rather weak. Okay, so yeah. that's that's one yeah. thing to say about it. Um, and you know, go read the, the the book and the references and so on. There's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Um, the the other thing is, how bad is CO2? I mean, see, we all exhale CO2. We got rid yeah, we got rid of humanity, even if it left the industrial world. That would greatly reduce CO2. Wouldn't that be a great benefit? Get rid of all the people. Um, <laughs> just, wow, we've got a perfect planet. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's silly, but the point is it's a perfectly natural substance, and it yeah. is literally the breath of life for plants. And we exactly. live on plants, guys, directly or indirectly. We live on yeah. plants. So, yeah. um, how bad is it? Well, in fact, there's all sorts of stats. I get some in the mail almost every day. Somebody sharing how the uh, plant crop yields have increased uh, yeah. over recent mm -hmm. years. Uh, that I think that is a real cause. I mean, in this yeah. case, CO2 really is causing some, something, namely a faster growth of plants. So yeah. if you put that all together, well, we should watch, uh, watch out, you know, global warming could be a thing and so on. But for goodness sake, it's not an apocalypse. And it yeah. may yeah. be a good thing. So give me a break, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, you know, and of course you can't... Uh, you can't uh, um, carry on this debate without a, a fairly uh, hard-eyed uh, look at the at the fact that there's a great deal of political power and 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 money at stake in the whole thing. And uh, you know, when you look at some of the more hysterical claims, like uh, our congresswoman from Brooklyn says we have 12 years to save the planet. Uh, you know, that's yeah. everyone knows that's complete nonsense, and yet she is uh, is uh, in many yeah. ways setting the the climate. Agenda in the, she should in the be Congress. instructed. She should be instructed to commit seppuku after twelve years. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't wish bad things on anyone, but yeah, no, I, no, I, I understand really. the temptation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there, there, there's a um, there's an interesting comment from uh, uh, listener uh, Troy, and uh, he says he wants to push back on the fact value separation claim, yeah. uh, insisting that one cannot drive an ought from an is statement eliminates a space for reasoning. David Hume violates that claim about two pages after making it strong fact values distinction i think people can actually see the comments so i'm not going to read the whole thing but but uh but That's but he is pushing back a little bit on uh on yeah. on, on this notion that uh that uh that that that, that hume uh, um, course, this yeah. idea that Hume makes. Uh, yeah, well, he may, it's a good point. Yeah. I mean, Sam has yeah. this in yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think the confusion may be between the value, of the, the fact, and the motivation that gets you to find the fact. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it's clear to me anyway that you can separate the two. I mean, suppose you find. And I gave an example in the book. If you sometimes it's it's very very difficult. Uh, example I give in the book: suppose you find there's a fire in the basement of your building, right? You don't need to evaluate whether it's true or not. You immediately react. You know, call the fire department, warn people. 
mm-hmm. so on, right? That's obvious. But if you encounter a fact like another example, like, you know, about the uh, performance of black undergraduates composed to white undergraduates, there's a statistical study which I talk about briefly in the, in the book. The first, your first reaction there should be to evaluate the truth of the fact. So I'm, I'm, well, I guess what I'm saying, with uh, uh, along with Hume, I think, is that the first reaction to a fact should be to evaluate its truth, not to act in any other way. But of course, that reaction involves a value. You value truth. Yes, it, it, in that sense, he's wrong. You, you have to value truth uh, above everything else. And that can't be proved by science or anything else. You either believe it or you don't. So to mm-hmm. that extent, I agree with him. But otherwise... Yeah. Otherwise, I'd like to hear what other uh, yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I think there's always been this kind of interplay between facts and values. I mean, that's what that that's what happens in the in the in the practice of science, you know, and especially in areas where you know it, it's a, it's not quite so um, uh, experimentally driven and uh, um, uh, materialistically driven, like for example, psychology or even evolutionary biology. You know, there 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 is this interplay, but uh, ultimately, as you say, you know, you know, if we're going to be scientists, we have to query nature in a way that we hope science gives or nature gives us an unbiased an answer, yeah. a- answer of, 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 of what it is you know and uh, uh yeah and, and martin hackworth goes on to say that uh, uh he makes a point that, uh, that 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 you have made which is that uh privately um you know they are alarmed by, by, uh, by what's going on in postmodern uh, the intrusion of postmodernism science. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, I think, is probably the latest uh, example of that. Uh, but they don't really want to speak no, up, didn't. and he says that Feynman would never get tenure today anyway. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, it's it's a reasonable claim, you know. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, not sure well, I, I believe mean, it. I but another example. Yeah, it's yeah. An interesting example. One yeah. is a, a, a retired editor of Nature mm-hmm. commented that Cook Crick and Watson would not have, uh, have been publi- published. Their paper would not be, be publishable in Nature as it is today. That's one thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other example is the uh, inclusive fitness guy. I'm blocking on his name. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, are you, you thinking of David, David Stone Wilson or? No, no. Or, uh, British uh, guy who died in Africa invented inclusive fitness. Oh, uh, that was um, uh, yeah, Hamilton. Hamilton. It was Hamilton. W. Yeah. D. Hamilton. W. Bill D. Hamilton. Yeah. I mm-hmm. counted his. Uh, pro- he's uh, probably number two or three in the history of evolution. Important mm-hmm. figures and so yes. on. Yes. Yes. And yeah. he published precisely one paper a year, so he wouldn't have got yeah. ten either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, he did. He, even then, he had difficulty uh, 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 securing a, an academic appointment. But it wasn't because of his publication record. It was because, uh, you know, he was uh, he was a rather, um, um, you know, interesting interesting character, to put it bluntly. You know, the kind of character that you often get with very bright people. Very you know, creative very, people. Very I, creative I, people. I, I went know. to a lecture when he was a terrible lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I can imagine he was. Yeah, in fact, I think that was one of the criticisms of him in his early career was that uh, undergrad he, just he did not under- like him as a lecturer. But so what? You know, look what yeah, he's given us. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm just going through these uh, these comments. We're getting uh, late into the time here. Um, yeah, we're getting a bit late. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, I, I want to give everyone a, a, a chance. Uh, uh, Hans Muller uh, recommends a book by actually a colleague of mine. Uh, uh, she was at my, uh, she is still at my home college, uh, Robin Kimmerer, who's written a wonderful oh. book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And, uh, you know, oh, it's, yeah. it's, my uh, wife so, yeah. okay, well, you know, endorsement passed on. Uh, uh, I, I agree with him. It's, she's a wonderful writer and, and uh, in contrast to Bill Hamilton, love loved by the undergraduate students at, uh, at, at my place before I retired. Um, and uh, let's see, Kathy Sahu, um, uh, let's see, what does she have to say? Yes, yeah. Uh, speaks a little bit about uh, the testing of IQ, especially in the army, what it, uh, what it uh, looks like. Uh, um, She's talking about a 40 point spread between adults, lower IQ, black GIs, increased their IQs quite a bit 
after a time in the army receiving education training. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, I, it, I can see there was some like, kinds of tests, uh, some kinds of tests, definitely, but, uh, but, 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 of course, that's not the only kind of IQ test that that has been yeah. uh, that has been done. Uh, Elizabeth Weiss uh, comes back and uh, and uh, makes a, a couple of comments in here. Yeah, they uh, were trustworthy enough. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. And uh, that's, that's again, sad. I mean, that's really sad. Yeah, and you know what's uh, what's what's driven that mistrust, you know, and and uh, again, you know, uh, this is just speaking from my experience working in a third world country, um, you know. Um, uh, to me, my colleagues who come here are exquisitely sensitive about uh, about local concerns, and and uh, and so you know maybe one bad apple spoils the entire thing for the rest of us. I don't know, but uh, uh, an interesting question is where that distrust has been learned. You know, what 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 has driven it? Uh, is it a grievance uh, thing? Is it actually bad behavior on the parts of anthropologists? I I I, I don't know, but that seems to be. Uh, um, you know, an important issue here. Um, let's see, uh, comment rather than a question. Professor Robert Winston is unequivocal that you cannot change your sex. He observes that we can, however, change our gender by mutilating ourselves, in, you know, in quotes, uh, uh, his term. Um, yeah, well. and, and you did address this uh, somewhat in your book, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, what are sex differences and, uh, you know, uh, and I can see a, a spectrum here, you know, not quite to the extreme that uh, that we see now, but you know, we we all know that there's you know there's genetic determination of sex, there uh, developmental uh, determinants of uh, of of the of the uh, sexual dimorphism, and then people do have perceptions of of themselves, you know, which are manifest in various kinds of body dysmorphias. But uh, uh, what's what's you know, like anorexia, anorexia for example? example. Uh, yeah. uh, but, you know, um, uh, this is another area where it seems unreason has, has really, really taken over and with tragic consequences for a lot really? of people, Tell I think. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Uh, let's keep going. Okay. Here's Elizabeth Weiss again. I'll go on to say that Native Americans have learned to be distrusting from activist anthropologists. So, so she is, uh, she, she, she has, a, has an opinion on that. And uh, uh, she would certainly be in agreement with, uh, with Robert Gordon, who I've been reading, who's, a, who's an anthropologist of the, of the Sand Bushman here. And he makes the very same, same point. And someone is asking, are you truly climate change deniers or simply skeptics? Well, I would bring myself down firmly and the skeptic uh, yeah, right. skeptic I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. I would deny the apocalypse yeah yeah that's right yeah <laughs> definitely yeah uh, and then uh, Kelly Ross asks don't East Asians test with higher IQs and Caucasians yep. well yes they do uh, but if they're so smart why is China a communist dictatorship I think the fault there lies in the <laughs> dictatorship itself rather than uh, than yeah. uh, 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 people I, I I don't know if you know John Darbyshire but uh, know you know he's, he, yeah yeah I mean he's 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 married to a Chinese woman and uh, he spends quite a bit of time in China spent you know has a lot of uh, speaks Chinese uh, fluently and uh, and he does make the point that uh, that the people in, of his acquaintance from China just uh, are just hold their government in utter contempt but uh, they can't you know they're, they're basically powerless to uh, oppose it uh, so that's I'll also uh, add that IQ is not wisdom very true very true very <laughs> true yes yeah Okay. Um, all right. I think uh, I think that's a good point to end our discussion. Uh, IQ is not wisdom, and uh, that's a very uh, that's a very wise thing to say. And so uh, let's uh, let's wrap it up here. I apologize to the commenters who uh, who we we couldn't get to, um, but uh, again, I would recommend uh, John Stadden's very fine book, Science in an Age of Unreason, and uh, it's a it's a very good read and. Uh, uh, and uh, just reading the book itself will be thoughtful, thought-provoking, but uh, also an entry into a lot of your prolific production of very interesting uh, uh, writings for the Martin Center. And so uh, we will call it a night then. And John, thank you again very much for being part of this, this webinar series. 
Thank you so much, Scott. Appreciate it. Okay.